Hi there, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria and welcome to my class today for the Drain event, which is what we've termed Battlefield Sabre. It's taken from Alfred Hutton's The Swordsman, the second edition from 1897. The second edition includes an appendix at the rear, which has in Sabre circles become very well known. This section was not included in the first edition and is inspired firstly by campaigns happening in the 1880s and 90s, and secondly by Hutton's own research into older historical fencing sources. This appendix focuses exclusively on how the British swordsman armed only with a sword or sabre should tackle an Afridi swordsman armed with a sword or large knife together with a shield or buckler. He compares the swordsmanship then present in Asia and um, in Afghanistan specifically with Elizabethan swordsmanship and he points out there's some parallels specifically in the fact that the Afridi swordsman doesn't lunge and recover as was convention in pretty much all uh, European fencing by this time but instead uses passing footwork and he says this is more similar to the Renaissance styles of fencing as exhibited in George Silver's works. They'd become convinced that to prepare soldiers for combat, more fighting needed to be injected into fencing training. So now let's move on to the techniques. One thing that we should note, and which is very relevant for the practice of these techniques, is where the buckler or shield is. Uh, to some extent how large it is as well, but whether it's held close to the body or held extended, this is a point of conjecture based on modern Indian martial arts and preserved Indian martial arts and based on period artwork showing Afghan and uh, Indian swordsmen, the buckler or shield is usually held relatively close to the body. It is not held out extended as we're used to seeing in European systems like Bolognese systems like Morozzo or indeed like uh, 133. And additionally, the form of cutting with the uh, curved Asian swords is a somewhat different to the form of cutting uh, with the sabres that we normally use. So this type of enforced grip um, was done with a stiff wrist and the cut was generated from the elbow and from the shoulder and with the full body movement and the passing footwork. So quite a different form of cutting. So not saying that we represent this perfectly in our demonstrations here, of course, but just so that you're aware, the form of using the sword is very, very different in Afghanistan compared to European sabre. For the purposes of these techniques, one person is armed with a shield and either a tulwa or pulwa, in other words a curved sword, or a chura, also known as a kyber knife, and the other is armed with a British regulation sword of some sort, which must be sharpened on the full edge for at least a few inches. So grip number one is against someone who has charged at you and given a cut from their right hand side towards your left. First parry high preem, pass in with the left foot. Grip their wrist with your thumb down, pulling their sword arm down and to the left. Next, either pommel them to the right hand side of their head, or draw back your right shoulder to prevent them countering, and cut or thrust wherever there's an opening available, either over or under their shield or sword. In grip number two, the opponent again charges at you with passing footwork, giving you a cut from their right hand side, downwards obliquely, towards your left. You, this time, parry in cart, pass in with the left foot, grip the wrist from underneath, and force it upwards and to the left. Draw back the right shoulder to prevent a counter, and cut or thrust wherever an opening is available, either over or under the shield or sword. Or, very promptly, deal him a strong blow on the right side of the head, Another option is to pass your sword over their left hand shoulder, behind their neck, and draw cut with the full edge to the back of their neck. These draw cuts with the full edge, which Hutton specifies, 
are something which is quite particular to Hutton's system here and very, very interesting and outside of the normal scope of what we find in British military swordsmanship. And a lot of people ask about false edges and we know that historically they were sharpened usually to make the thrust more effective. But it's very, very interesting that in this particular section, Hutton being inspired by earlier sources, has found a use to include things like the coup de Jarnac to the back of the knee or hamstrings, um, and also in this case to the back of the neck. So it's a really fantastic example of where Hutton is looking outside of the scope of what's traditional in British military swordsmanship and looking for new ways to use the existing military sword without changing its design. In grip number three, the enemy now charges at you and gives a cut from their left hand side towards your right. You in response parry terse. You pass in with the left foot so that you can come close enough to grab securely. The first option is to force the arm upwards into the right hand side and attack under the shield or force the arm down and to the right and attack over the shield. In some cases, these things will just happen in the course of the fight and you won't ne necessarily have the ability to manipulate the arm exactly where you want it, you'll find it's either a bit higher or a bit lower, or the person moves their shield a bit higher and lower. But basically, I think what Hutton's showing us here is that you can either attack above or below, whichever is most convenient. Now we have a very famous technique which is found in a series of um, small sword treatises and a rapier as well, I believe. But um, the one that I'm most familiar with is Domenico Angelo who does this. And in this case, the opponent attempts to either drop their shield or use their shield as a kind of battering ram or a bludgeoning instrument. And they attempt to pass in after your terse parry and hit you in your right hand side, probably your head, um, and in response, you move the right shoulder back, you move your sword behind your back, you present your point at their chest or stomach and run them through. In grip four, they attempt to cut low on your inside leg, that is cutting from their right hand side towards the left hand side of your lead leg. Firstly, you could parry septime. You now grab their wrist from above and force their arm to the left hand side, opening up the center line and you can either cut or thrust wherever you see an opening as you see fit. Your other option is to parry low preem. Having formed the guard in low preem, you then grab the wrist from above. Hutton gives the option to from there, pommel to the chin, although of course there are other riposte options available to you as well. The other attacking option given by Hutton is a cut to the outside of the leg. In this case, you parry low second. Hutton makes an interesting observation here, saying that in this particular position, there aren't many grips that are advisable. And so he advises to simply riposte with a cut or a thrust as you see fit to any opening. So you parry low second and immediately riposte. We are equipped in a way that's roughly uh, in line with what's described in Hutton's appendix. And in this case, the um, Afridi swordsman is armed with a shield or buckler of indeterminate size. We've chosen something that's a bit like a large buckler, um, commonly called in Indian martial arts a dal, because that's what we had available for training purposes. But the originals vary in size. They can be really quite large dals, like this example here. Um, all the way down to small 30 centimeter uh, bucklers. In reality, what the Afridi could be armed with could be um, a, a tolwa or a polwa or a chura, other, otherwise known as a chara, pronounced differently in uh, different regions. Now the longer sword, this is an example of a Afghan polwa. And the polwa is um, defined by having these dropped down quillons and a hemispherical hollow pommel. 
a very comfortable grip to hold, but quite confined grip, and forces you pretty much to ha have the sword in a hammer fist grip. You can't grip it in the way that you grip a European sabre usually. And these do have various types of blades, but they're all relatively consistently uh, curved. Most of them are curved, um, and they're relatively broad compared to, certainly compared to officers' sabres of the time. They're also not particularly long. They rarely exceed 30, 31 inches, um, or around 83 centimeters. Um, so they are curved um, chopping swords with a point of balance usually relatively far out from the hand. Another version of this which people are more familiar with is the Indian Talwar, which really only majorly um, differs from the Polwa in that it has a flat or almost flat disc pommel. But you grip it in much the same way. Most people find the Polwar grip slightly more comfortable, but they're used in very much similar way. This is just the Indian version. And these were to be found uh, being used in Afghanistan as well. Um, so in fact, um, Hutton talks about the Tulwar rather than the Polwar, but you could find either of them. They are both essentially the longer sword available to people in Afghanistan at this time. And the other very common type of sword, again mentioned by Hutton, is the Chura or Chara. Uh, commonly known as the Kyber knife, um, which is a T-section blade related to the um, Ottoman Yatagan, almost certainly. And it has no real handguard to speak of. It doesn't really have a pommel. Um, it's perhaps a little bit sing similar to medieval Langmesser in some ways, and in other ways not. It's more like a Yatagan, really. But as you will see, it is straighter and it is shorter. Now, despite the fact that it's pointier, it is not a thrusting weapon, and in fact, period sources explicitly state that these word were used for chopping and hacking. So to conclude, by 1897, due to various factors, studying historical fencing sources, but also uh, the realization of the day that uh, training needed to be a little bit more inclusive and broader, Hutton and Mathy were great exponents of probably what we'd later call com uh, combatives. And this was something obviously that uh, Barton Wright as well, um, pioneered, but I think that Hutton and Mathy don't get enough um, credit for, for what they were doing. And really this is the end, I suppose, of the era, the end of the 19th century is the end of the era when swordsmanship was still being seen as a serious military practice. And so in a way, we never got to see this developed further. Uh, and, and they didn't have a huge number of sources available to them. As we've seen, they drew mainly on George Silver. But I have to say from a personal point of view, having practiced these techniques, but also being someone who's um, over the course of more than 20 years practiced other medieval and Renaissance systems, I do think that some of these techniques could be refined and improved. And in some cases, I think there are better options um, that we could now draw upon, but which they weren't necessarily aware of and weren't particularly trained in. We have to bear in mind that whilst um, Hutton and Matthew were very practiced swordsmen, they were very practiced within the systems of their day, and they were relatively new to the earlier historical systems. But I think that they should be credited for what they did achieve, and that was recognizing that for battlefield sabre techniques, you needed to include a little bit more wide repertoire than is just covered in the fencing cell of their day. And I should also point out that, of course, this isn't supposed to be relied on in isolation. It's supposed to be used in conjunction with what you've learnt in the rest of that system. Um, so you're supposed to have learnt foil, you're supposed to have learnt conventional sabre, and then on top of that, you're supposed to learn the grips and closes, the grappling, the wrestling, in addition to uh, that core fundamental sabre method. So I hope this has been enjoyable and useful. Um, feel free to practice it techniques. I'd look forward to feedback on this as well. And I'd also be interested to know if there are other systems from other parts of uh, the world. Are there French or Russian or um, Italian systems that use anything similar to this? There are grips uh, and closes. There are grips and closes shown in anti-bayonet uh, parts of sabre manuals. Um, and I know that there's at least one French manual that shows the use of the scabbard as a parrying device, which is very, very interesting. So there were other people in other parts of the world at this period, at this time, looking at other ways of creating more fully rounded um, and uh, sort of competent fighting systems using the weapons of the day.